Welcome to my talk on using the Yocto Auto Builder for build and release management. Um, first of all, I guess I'll tell you a little bit about myself. So I started out and then I designed a schematic and PCB for the Cold Fire 5235. And then I brought it up, worked on U-Boot, porting it to our specific board, and Micro C Linux was our distribution and our build system. And brought up the Linux kernel drivers, used all the good open source tools that we all use. And in the last couple of years, I've been working with the Yocto project tools for some of our new, one of our new products. So this talk is not based on Dora the Explorer. It's actually based on the Dora version of Pocky and Open Embedded Core. Um, just, we've been stuck on this as a lot of us are because of other management priorities. So we do have some tech, technical debt that we have to pay off. And basically it's, if we find a bug that's available, that's been fixed in the upstream, we pull it back. Um, so build and release management in general. Um, why do you need something like the auto builder? It's just because of the complexity of the code. Um, you have your local.conf file, which you have to modify in order to get things working for various recipes. And then you're gonna have multiple layers, starting with meta, part of open embedded core. And then you're gonna have to start importing, say, like we actually use Freescale layers. So we have like four or five of those. And then on top of those, you're gonna have to make BB appends to customize your layers, or customize the functionality of those upstream recipes. So as you're developing, you're gonna have a lot of changes that you're gonna to have to make. And you might start working on one item and then switch to another one because you find out, oh, I have to work on this. So you're gonna have changes scattered around. And I've done it oftentimes before to where I forget about a change and then I don't check it in and then it becomes missing and then causes a bug. So you need something official to pull cleanly from source and then do a build so you can avoid those kind of errors. So we decided to use Yocto Projects Auto Builder because it was, it was there and it's open source. I think other tools are open source as well, but this seemed relatively easy to use, so we grabbed that. It's based on BuildBot, which is a Python library, which allows you to more easily do continuous integration. AutoBuilder itself, the code adds support for layer retrieval. So all the layers that you need. And then there are custom build steps to handle all the things that you have to do as a, de as a developer of open embedded core. So the creation of configuration files, building different bit bake targets, and then artifact publication. There are nice build steps created that you can use. So this is a screenshot of the primary interface that you'll be using. It's a web interface that controls all of your builds. So the jobs go across the top, and then as you click on various links, you get into the job and you can trigger builds, and then see log output of if anything went wrong, like red for that failed build. This is actually a screenshot from last week, so Things are always happening on the auto builder. 
And the way that AutoBuilder is organized is how BuildBot is kind of organized. So I grabbed this diagram from buildbot.net and they would like to refer to their web UI and workers as a master and then the workers. But for Yocto Auto Builder, you're going to have controller, a controller and then workers. Now the official Auto Builder, it has one controller and nine workers. That's because they have such a large range of jobs that they have to run nightly. Just because the Yocto project is so big, you have lots of machines and lots of different targets that you need to build for. Whereas for our project, we only have a one-to-one -one ratio. We have one controller and one worker, just because our problem set is so much smaller. So what is a job? A job is the file configuration file that you're going to be creating to run various jobs. The general sections that you have are the title, which is used to refer to the job in the rest of your configuration files. And then you have your repo section, which, which puts down which layers that you want to retrieve with a repo URL, which is the Git repository where that's located. Or you can use files as well. I've not experimented with any other fetchers. And then we've got build steps, which are the actual steps that you would do as a developer to build your images. And then a scheduler is the last thing you need to make for a job. And that is going to be usually a time schedule, like a nightly build, or it can be something based off of a Git repository or monitoring a Git repository. And then going back to the official auto builder, they have 23 jobs, just looking at their, looking at the official website. And the ones in yellow are generally images. And then that includes the different machine targets. And then they do Debian packages, iPackage RPM. And then they have some x86 in there as well. And then the, the tiny target, the stuff in blue is going to be some QA jobs. And I just took a look at a few of these, like the log rotate is building a base image, adding log rotate to it, and then running some QA checks on that. And then in red are the build tools that get built on the auto builder. They're just like the Eclipse plugin and probably the SDK package. I'm not entirely sure because I didn't delve into that. Question? Okay, the question is kind of do, do you, does everybody use the auto builder, the official auto builder, or do you set up your own? And the answer is usually you're going to set up your own. The, this URL that you can go to is just the Yocto project's official auto builder. And then once you set it up on your local server, it'll be available for you to control. So for my project's jobs, we have a much smaller subset of that. Uh, one point is that I, for the creation of our jobs, you definitely go back to the example configuration files for the jobs that are within the Yocto Auto Builder Git repository. Uh, the first thing we have is a nightly job, which mirrors the nightly job for the official. And that just does a bitbake-c fetch all, so it downloads all the sources. It actually doesn't do too much for us since we're not adding too many different recipes frequently in our development. 
So I don't even think we download too much nightly. And then we, or I added the QEMU x86 job as a sanity check, just taking our images and then building it on that machine. And then we have two more jobs for a master, master branch, which is our main development branch. And then additionally, we have a stable branch, which doesn't change as much, and it's used for releases. We have another job to build that. And then we have a, a new job recently, which builds a single RPM, which is used by one of our product teams. So layer repositories. Going back to the repos section of the job configuration file, you're going to have two types of layer repositories. The first one is going to be your upstream repositories, which are like Pocky and Meta FSL ARM. Those are usually going to be a fixed source revision. You're going to pick uh, release from, that, from those projects and then fix them for your build and then you're going to develop your layers on top of that using the OE core layering system. And the ones in blue are, represent our local layers and since those are changing a lot more often, we have, we have those generating those are the ones that result in the most change of our nightly builds. So you see that like the first one is version 1.0. So basically what happens is the auto builder builds from the head of our code and then taking those upstream repositories, take the artifacts and then if we want to use them for a release, we tack on our version number on top of that. And then as our code progresses, we'll get more builds. And I'm actually, like in this example, the first one is February 10th, and then a couple of commits later, we, version 1.1 is actually February 15th, and so forth. So translating those Git diagrams into our configuration file, we have some we have the first one for meta FSL arm, and that is, we actually specify the source rev hash for that. And that's our fixed version. There's, like for certain projects, they use a, a branch. Like you could say, like if you're using Pocky, you could say the door branch, but you actually want to control it more tightly. So for all of our upstream uh, layers, we use the hash. And then our in-house layers are using the master branch because they're always moving. So if, when you specify master, it just goes to the Git repository, your local Git repository, and then grabs the head. Now kind of as a side note, I mean it's part of the release process is that we have some checkout scripts to check out our layers for our developers because it's just easy for them to use a script to check everything out. And right, it, it matches the repo section of the auto builder job. And then it does the same thing with the fixed upstream and then the local heads of the master. And another, another script that we use is a release script. So that gets generated whenever a version is released. And that is going to specify the source rev, like the specific source rev that was used in each build. So if you found a bug within your image, your released image, you could use that script to check out the set of layers. And then you could go back and debug the build if necessary. So now I'm going to start talking about some of the custom build steps that we created. And the first one is one that we use for our release process. 
we have, well, the generation of that release script uh, happens automatically with a build step. It actually uses the output from the publish layer tarballs. So that's a directory, and then it has the name of the layers and then the source rev. So I had, been, I had that for a while, but wasn't really using it. But once I realized that I needed to generate this release script, I used, basically just used the file names to, and converted those to generate the build script. And then whenever you do a release, you're gonna need to do certain actions, um, like create tags in your Git repositories for your layers so that you can go back and reference when you're analyzing your repo history for bugs and right, and then commit the release script. And also we have, a, we have a recipe specifically for tracking the version of our layers. I mean, not layers, of our images. So there's a little bit of automation there as well where we bump that image version for our release candidates. And let's see. Right, and then these actions actually occur within the work directory for the specific build job. So you have, there's actually a copy of Git repositories there that you can use. And then the commits, the commits for the release script and then the image version about PAMP there. And then we also tag our local layers so that when you actually perform the release, you grab this particular artifact of your layer repositories. And then if you accept your, your auto builder output, you actually perform the git pushes locally to your, your actual local repositories. Right. So along the idea of trying to control more things within source control is the template conf variable. Uh, first of all, one of the first things you do when you set up your build environment for Pocky Open Embedded is you have to source this OE init build env script, appropriately named, and right it it usually it just pulls some default files from I believe it's MetaYocto and then puts them into your build directory. Now what the template conf lets you do is specify a different directory within your layers. And that's nice because of the controlling things within source control. So you specify that as an environment variable when you're sourcing that script. And it'll pull, it'll pull from that directory and then install your own custom local.conf sample and then your bblayers.conf sample as well in your conf directory. Now, in order to be able to use that within your auto builder job, you, you're gonna use something called run preamble. And if you look at the Python code for this build step, all it does is it calls, it sources that build BNV setup script. So initially, so what I did, because like I said, I'm working on Dora, is that I created a second run preamble build step just to add the template conf directory. And like last week, I found out that in later branches, they've added a alt command property that you can put into, or that you can specify as an argument for your build step, and then if you use that, you could specify your template conf in there. And then just as a aside, when you're setting up your configuration files, um, there's a build step to create an auto.conf configuration file, which in the order of precedence puts it before the local.conf. So if there's anything that you need to do specifically for your auto builder job, use that build step and then just put more entries 
for your Pocky configuration in there, like if you wanted to override a package version or something, you just put it into auto.conf. Let's see. So another custom build step that you might need to do is publish artifacts. First of all, if you look at if you look at this build step code, there's a big if statement, like it'll, you specify artifacts, and then the if statement will go through and take various actions when you're publishing your build artifacts. But the majority of them within this exact build step are for the Yocto project. So when you're creating your own custom one, there's a lot of clutter. So another thing that the default publish artifacts does is it copies everything within the, de within the deploy images directory. So that includes like an image name and then it'll, it'll have a symbolic link to the actual image and then it'll have a build stamp. So when you're building, that's for if you're building multiple images in one instance so you can keep track. You can go back if you needed to, but you don't really need that for a, for a release. So I wrote my own published artifacts syntech, and we, we are just using four artifacts, the U-boot binary, device tree, Linux kernel, and then a specific file system image format. So I added some coding tips for when you're working with build steps. It's like one thing that happens is that you need to map stuff that you set up in your environment. So a lot of the configuration with an auto builder occurs with environment variables that are available to the, to the servers. And those are written in the file autobuilder.conf. You set environment variables in there and then there's buildset.py, which does the exact, the, it does the instantiation of the build steps as objects. And it will actually read stuff from the environment, set a Python variable, and then use it in each build steps initialization. Right, and then whatever action occurs is where you use those variables. Now one thing that, that you might run into if you're searching your code is that there is a second space for your environment variables configuration. It's Yocto Auto Builder Setup, and that's all placeholders. So I wasted a little bit of time setting variables in there and seeing nothing happen. So it's a nice, nice tip. Uh, another part of creating your build steps is that a lot of the functionality comes from shell commands. So within the, within the build step, you construct a command string, which is just the shell commands, and you append to it, and it can get pretty big. And if you go to, when you go to the auto builder log output for this exact build step, you're gonna get a really long string that goes way off the screen. And then you have to scroll over. It's just not good for when you're trying to see if what the command string that you created was sane. So what I found out is that you can replace those semicolons to the line continuation with just carriage returns. And it just, it makes the output a lot better. So eventually I got some complicated if statements and since those are going way off the screen and those are impossible to read if they're not indented. So that was, so adding the carriage returns was perfect for that. Then moving away from build steps a little bit to using premiers. So within 
Pocky Open Embedded Core, you can use something that's called a pre-mirror to, to speed up your builds and optimize space. A pre-mirror uh, is of your estate cache directory and then your downloads directory. So just like in the diagram, your, your premier is read, premier is read by your developer build. And what happens is as the developer is building, their BitBake instance will generate a hash and then it will go to the premier first and then see if see if there's an artifact within the estate cache which is available. And if there is, the, that instance, the developer's instance of BitBake will create a symbolic link within its local estate cache directory. And then whenever the build process needs to grab it, it'll just go there. So it's a little bit more space efficient. And then the downloads directory is treated the same way with the uh, looking for the blob within the premier and then creating a symbolic link if it's available. And then if anything needs to be built separately, like if there's not a cache hit on that, it'll just populate the estate cache, the local estate cache or downloads directory just as BitBake normally does. So if you're going to use this within your auto builder you actually, all you do is you set the estate cache value and the DL dir value there. And the instance of BitBake that's run by the auto builder will just use the premier and then it'll be the, the only one writing to that. Like another, another thing that happens when you're running an auto builder instance is that your disk, disk space gets chewed up as you're building nightly or whatever frequency. So I had to create a cron job to clean it. It's pretty simple. It just goes to the publish artifacts directory, looks for anything that's older than five days or whatever time period you want, and then it executes the very safe command of rm-rf. <laughs> so you don't want to run this as root. Bad idea. So another thing that you can do is, that you might need to do is run the estate cache management script. It's something that's available within OE core and it just, I believe it just reads your estate cache directory. Oops, so you'd run it you would run it from the same environment as your auto builder, and then it would just go to the pre-mirror directory and then clean that out if required. I actually haven't had to run it too often because lately our code delta has been pretty small. Like another thing that I ran into is we have a hybrid Windows and Linux environment, so our publish, I tried to, I tried a new thing where I was publishing, publishing things directly into our Windows share, which is where our official releases occur. Windows does not support symbolic links, so each of your 500 megabyte image files gets duplicated in there. That's not, that doesn't make your IT people happy. Uh, just as uh, another thing for your actual configuration storage, I just created another directory within the Yocto Auto Builder source tree, build set config syntec, and then put all of our jobs there. So we have our own we have our own copy of Yocto Auto Builder Git repository. We have our own branch. And then another thing you have to set up is controller.cfg. That includes your login credentials for your web GUI accounts. So you don't want to put that onto GitHub. I believe there were some security holes with people publishing their secret credentials on there. Uh, right, and then of course your autobuilder.conf 
containing your configuration. Also, we also put that into our local Yocto Auto Builder repository. And the tips and tricks section. Right, going back to the, that one job, which is the RPM build for one of our teams, our nightly build, our nightly image builds didn't happen frequently enough for them, and there was a bit of overhead with the actual release process. So they figured out that there was this scheduler called Git Polar, and what it does is it's one that monitors, it's the one that monitors a Git repository, looks for any changes, and then if there are, there's like a cooling off period, like 60 seconds or something. And then once that occurs, it will trigger a build. So this job at its core just does bit bake and then the, the recipe for their project. And that's actually one of the items that you would put into the auto.conf configuration file. So this is actually something that's documented in the project manual. It's like in a configuration file, you can override the source rev. It's like ordinarily for a recipe and a version, you would fix a source rev at that git hash. And what you do in your auto.conf file for this job is you override that with auto rev, which will tell, tell the bitbake fetcher to grab the head of the branch that's specified and then you also need to override the package version so that it has this nice git string and then part of the hash so you can identify it. One thing that's bitten me a couple of times with appending stuff within that top level configuration file is the order of appends. If you use this append flag right here, it's like I always, I always forget that you can't put it at the end it's like every single time. It's like the US plugging in a USB cable, you're always gonna get it wrong the first time. So just, just as a nice tip, the append will go first before any package name uh, specifications. It's like another thing that you wanna use with the auto builder is the build history. That's something that you can put into your auto.conf. And what it does is it has the image recipe inherit a BB class. And each time an image is built, it's going to put a bunch of metadata into a Git repository that you specify. And it tracks, it'll output every single file that's in the file system. It's permissions and owner and group, and it will also output the data about each of the, each of the packages that get built. So the versions, the files contained within. And what you can do is each time, well each time you build or if you use tag, if you tag that output with the version number of your releases, you can make a comparison between, say, your nightly builds or if you wanted to go from released version to released version, and you can see if anything has changed in that. So if a file disappears that you weren't intending or a really, something that's supposed to be really big, it's really small, you can use that to try to identify bugs before, before they get into the field or identify them early. And now to the section about future tasks. Uh, one thing that happens frequently with, well, not too frequently, but often enough with our auto builder is that you get external layer outages. So a lot of your upstream layers come from GitHub, git, git.freescale.com or Yocto project itself. And you can run into network problems like 
say, the some kind of botnet attacks DYN, which provides DNS for GitHub. That happened earlier this year. And that day, I was trying to build something with the auto builder, and then it just didn't work. It couldn't reach GitHub. And then, of course, you might have local IT issues as well. So there is a feature within the auto builder, which is to use a mirror for the external layers. It's not super well documented, and it is a little bit of a work in progress. Like, I was just trying to get it done before the conference. So the one variable that you set is the ogit mirror directory, and then that gets passed through into the build steps. And the checkout layers build step will actually try to use it as a mirror. I did have to add some code to resolve layers, the resolve layers build step, which for any layer repository that's a branch based, it will try to go and retrieve the source rev. And I also had to pass that environment variable into the build step when it instantiated resolve layers. Now I did, I did hack checkout layers a little bit and then, so I actually changed the behavior of the underlying checkout. Like this is very specific to the code so I don't know how useful it is to you guys. But right before I left, I think I figured out that in your checkout layers, you're gonna wanna use method fresh and mode full. Um, once you get into the code, there's not any documentation on that, on the checkout layers mode steps specifically, but that's what I think will work so far. And I think that if it, if you do specify this mode, it will always go to the mirror directory if it's available. I haven't fully figured out what the best way to do this yet is. And let's see. Combining repos and the checkout scripts. This is something that goes back to the idea of trying to control things within source control. So once you have your auto builder job and then your checkout scripts, they, they actually have contain the same metadata. And that's not good because if you make a change in one place, it might not, it might not Go, it doesn't go automatically to the other place. So then you're bound to run into bugs. I definitely introduced some bugs by doing that. So one outstanding problem is trying to convert between the two. I don't know if it's just using that auto builder configuration file to as the actual source for the checkout script. Um, I do know that this problem is, well, BitBank provides the downloads directory for, for um, build source retrieval. So it might be nice to include those libraries so that maybe you could also use the, you could use BitBank's mirror code somehow. I know there's other work for, to try to automate layer retrieval as well because it's, such a big problem. Um, another thing that AutoBuilder is good for is the PR service. That's, that's actually something that you use for, to help you track your package revision. So anytime there's a change in your recipe, it's going to automatically bump a revision number, like the last number in your package version. And like the documentation for this specifies that your, that whatever your official package feed needs to use the service so that your released packages can be consistent. So auto builder is perfect for that. You gotta, you have to start the BitBake PR serve as a service and then pop in this value PR serve host into your auto.com file. There are a couple of more 
variables which I have not added to this slide, but they're within the mega manual. And then another thing that I'm going to have to do whenever I implement this is periodically use this BitBake PR server tool to export that database so that it can be backed up in case, in case our build server goes poof. And the last thing that I wanted to get done sometime is implement automated runtime testing. Uh, the Yocto project uses this, uses this extensively with the auto builder. And what it is is you create, you, create a, you create tests within your meta layer or your layer, and then you add those to various, to your build configuration file, and then you actually run a specific target called test image for your image that gets built. And then what it does is it will spin up an instance of QEMU and then with your image, and then it will issue commands via SSH to that instance. And then you basically write something just to check and see if the last change that you made, like if you develop a feature, you go and you write some tests in shell script, and then it runs them, and if it, if it passes or fails, the BitBaker will report that, and then it comes out in a nice report. So it goes back to that first slide with all those jobs, with, your, with all those QA jobs. So this would be perfect for continuous integration and try to cut down on the bugs in your images. So that's pretty much it. Thanks for coming. Are, are there any questions? Um, I was able to, I worked on a couple, like I found out about the, about the automated tests. So then I worked, as I was working on some features, I did write some tests and then they, the tests worked pretty well and, but I just haven't had a chance to put them into the auto builder infrastructure. So I, like I have, I have my own layer called meta syntech test of all things that has those has, it has a couple of tests, but I just haven't had a chance to fully integrate it into Auto Builder. And what are you doing Yeah, it's it's just a checkout. It's just a shell script, and it just checks out. It clones the layers, and then uses some git commands to pick the specific revisions. Any other questions? Oh, what, so the question is, what's the general purpose of the auto builder? It, Oh, so maybe the question is more why the auto builder versus other tools like Jenkins or yeah. um, it was just it was something that was in the Yocto project. So I just wanted I just decided to grab that because also we didn't have we didn't have continuous integration in any other groups in our department. Um, so I was kind of the the first person to do it. Since we didn't have anything, I was like, oh, Auto Builder seems OK. So I just grabbed that and started using it. Right, that, that was another pro. So Darcy said that um, there's also the integration with um, 
with BitBake and then the Yocto project tools. That was, that was another benefit. So you don't have to, I didn't have to write more glue code for doing the actual build steps like the configuration file generation and publishing the artifacts. Some of that was already there. I had a template to work off of as well. Oh, so the, so the statement is that it would be nice if there was more integration between the Yocto Auto Builder and then other, the other um, continuous integration tools that are, that I guess corporate entities are more aware of, which, which makes sense. <laughs> I'm, I'm actually not a developer for the Octo Auto Builder, so I just use it. Yeah, but there there are some people in the room who actually work on it. Are there any other questions? Here, I should give you this microphone. I was told to <laughs> give it to question, ans question askers. <laughs> so the diagram of people that have Yacht Auto Builder and other Auto Builder experience might not be overlapping, but can you, we use Jenkins and quite successfully. Um, any c advantages that you would see the Yacht Auto Builder over, over Jenkins? Um, so yeah, that's a um, common question. Uh, so basically, obviously do the setup that works for you. Um, if the community finds that uh, the work that's been done on AutoBuilder, which is essentially just a layer on top of BuildBot, if the community looks at that and says this is a value and we can see ways that we can use this to our advantage, contact us and we can move stuff forward. The reason we use it is very, um, is very internally, uh, I don't want to say greedy, but like it's for our own purposes. So we have our own tests that are like baked into AutoBuilder that it would take a lot of work for us to move that to a different system. So we're currently using it to our benefit. But if you look at the code and say, you know, we could use this at our corporation, it just needs to have this feature and this feature. For example, somebody men mentioned plugins, which is definitely something that we'd be interested in. So the more people from the community that speak up on the mailing list or just in general uh, and say, here's what we'd love to see in this and this tool looks like it's promising, uh, the more work we can do on it. So as of today, to answer your question, uh, yes, there's a lot of plans that we could go forward and do that sort of thing, add plugins and, and make it more useful for the community, but uh, I, don't think, I don't think that the use cases we have for it are gonna be shared with everybody else. So we just need to know which direction we need to go. 
All right, everybody, I'm told that there is only one minute left, so I guess that's the end of my talk. Thanks for coming.